on the person. You know, like this person has become uh, almost something like an idol to you. Like, you know, I see that happen too. So, so, so it's really just about who you are taking as a spiritual guide, who you're taking as a spiritual guide. You don't know about it. You can do it with you. Other than you. I've been around all of them, I've seen their you know, Anybody who talks about it, I'm just thinking of it. I'm not thinking of the honor. But anyone who talks about it, it's definitely a bad thing. It's also not thinking of the honor. It has that, you know, it has that, that dual nature. It can be very important to you, and it can be very, very harmful to you. I think what you have to think about going in is consulting your own heart. Prophet Ali said to step to your back, ask your own heart, and 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 have a good enough grasp and understanding of your religion, so that if somebody says something that uh, you're uncomfortable with, you feel confident articulating your discomfort. Whoa. right? And it doesn't mean that you have to uh, um, uh, destroy their credibility in front of everybody, but. You know, this person actually comes to my apartment. You know, I'm like, no. Like I've, 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 I've especially heard of women being put in very compromised positions by people who were supposed to be serving as their spiritual teachers, right? So you have to know your religion well enough. If he says, you know, you just got a new place. Uh, there's this dua that I make for all of my students. I want to go into your uh, house and make the dua just to make sure that the place is, is spiritually, you know, cleansed. Then he comes in and says, but I always make it in the bedroom. Let's go, let's go in there. Just, you know, just, just to make sure. You know, I, I'm feeling, I just, you know, I want to go and just recite Bakara, you know, just in the bedroom, just to make sure. And he says, you know, I, I usually do it with my shirt off. That's just, that's just, that's just the way I normally, you know, it's just something, you know, at some point you have to say, whoa, stuck for a while. I don't know if this is acceptable to some of your students or people who um, accept your guidance, but it's not acceptable to me. My celebrity. So I, I brought you to my class not because I thought you were interrupting, but my celebrity. So that you know, so you have to have. You can't be. Um, you can't be um, uh, just a leaf in the wind. You know, you have to actually know what kind of guidance you want. And I think a lot of people that enter those relationships, the problem is that they don't know what they want. They want, it's a lot of different things they want. Maybe they want some paternal, they want some fatherly or some motherly kind of embrace. They want spiritual guidance. They want attention. They want, they want all kinds of things. But I think if you know, I want to be a better Muslim, I want to have better character. I want to see the ideals of my religion put into practice. That's what I want here. Then I think you're, you know, you're much more focused. I'm not looking for, um, you know, anything else. I think in that you can be, you can be much more focused, and you can have a a better set of criteria whereby which to judge is this relationship good for me or not. If that makes sense, inshallah. Bismillah. Bismillah You guys just walking around. You got to have a seat. You got to have a seat. Son, son, just have a seat. 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 So we've come to chapter 51. This is Babu Majafi Asma'i Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. What has been narrated concerning the names of the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam? And one of the things that's, um, you know, like, a, like a, uh, uh, an Arabic convention is that Hetheratul Asma Tadullu ala Sharaf Aw Yani Ihtiman. That the more names a thing has indicates. Its importance or its its status, its standing. So if something has a lot of names, that is an indication that that thing is very important. So practical example: look at all the names we have for money: dope, bread, paper, 
right? I mean, you know, you can go cheese. I mean, you can go on and on, right? Dinero, money. Yes. Right. We're talking about even in, even in one person's uh, language, they'll give a lot of names to this thing. That indicates that, you know, it has importance because it has so many names. Similarly, the Prophet وسلم, had a lot of names. The ones that we customarily refer to him as is Muhammad and Ahmed. Those are the names of the Prophet وسلم, that we know. Right? Bismillah. 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 Those are the names of the Prophet. MashaAllah, how you doing? Those are the names of the Prophet that we know Muhammad, Ahmed. But here we have An Muhammad ibn Jubair ibn Mut'im An Abihi Qala Qala Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam Inna li asma'an Ana Muhammad Wa ana Ahmed Wa ana al-Mahi Alladhi yamhu Allahu bihi al-Kufr وأنا الحاشر الذي يحشر الناس على قدميه وأنا العاقب والعاقب الذي ليس بعده نبي. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم said on the authority of Muhammad ibn Jubayr ibn Mut'im on the authority of his father the Messenger of Allah said I have several names I have many names I am Muhammad which means the author Praised. The word Muhammad means the one that is praised often. And I was I was recently with uh, one of my teachers, and he said, if a person needs a practical, accessible miracle, whereby which they can establish the the truth of the prophet's prophethood, you only need to look at his prominence. Sallallahu alaihi wasallam. When we spoke about this last week, that this was a man. In the middle of the Arabian desert, and the Arabs had no civilizational credits to their, and now this man, whose mission began with him in a cave alone, saying Iqra, his name is known all over the world. It is right now the most popular name in the world, Muhammad. There's more people named Muhammad than any other name in the world. His name is being mentioned at all times, somewhere as the earth is revolving around the sun and spinning on its axis, there is always going to be someone somewhere calling the other. The name Muhammad is being said alongside the name of God at all times, perpetually. Just because there's Muslims everywhere, right? Every time there's Muslims, right? Right? So, this, his name is Muhammad. You know, there's a beautiful story that the pagan Arabs, and this shows you how you should deal with haters. When people talk about haters, and the pagan Arabs, they used to say Muhammad. Oh no, oh, Muhammad, no, Mudamdam. Mudamdam was the name they used to say. Mudamdam means the, uh, the oft criticized one, right? To be the meme is someone that people criticize. The mean. So they used to call the Prophet Mudammam. And so one of the Sahaba, may God be pleased with them, they were in Mecca and they heard them referring to the Prophet in this way. Mudammam, Mudammam, Mudammam. And they were really affected by this. You know, it hurts us when we hear somebody we love being uh, slandered, being spoken ill of, that hurts us. So he went back to the Prophet والسلام, and he was like sad and he said, Ya Rasulullah, I was in Mecca and I heard them referring to you as Mudamma. And the Prophet says, SubhanAllah. He said, Glory to God. Look at how Allah has protected me from their from their, their ill, their evil words. My name was Muhammad. And they're talking about some guy named Mudamma. <laughs> you know, he said, SubhanAllah. He says, SubhanAllah. Look at how Allah is protecting. They attribute all of this bad stuff to some guy named Muhammad. My name is Muhammad. I don't know. It's almost like, I don't know who you're talking to. You're not talking about me. That's not even my name. 
you can't be talking about me, right? So the Prophet والسلام, he said, I am Muhammad and I am Ahmed. You know, it's interesting concerning names, the Prophet والسلام, and you have to understand his character to understand these hadith. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya yuhal mudathir, kum fa'andir. Oh, the one wrapped in a garment, arise and mourn. Why did God have to say to him, kum fa'andir? Because the Prophet ﷺ was a very unassuming person. The hardest aspect of prophecy for the Prophet ﷺ was being known to people, was being identified by people being notable. His preference personally would have been to remain hidden, unseen, worship Allah, and just mind my business. The Prophet ﷺ, every biographical vignette of the Prophet ﷺ that we have covering his life before Nabuwa indicates a very shy person, a very unassuming person, a person that did not want spotlight, did not want limelight, did not want notability, notoriety. So the hardest thing for him was to be forward, be out there, be the center of attention, to attract people's gazes, their you know, conversation, etc. So whenever the Prophet وسلم, is saying something about himself, no, listen very closely because he's only saying this so that we know who he is. It's not boasting, it's not bragging. You know, uh, the Prophet ﷺ said, I am the best of the children of Adam. This is not bragging. This is not, this is not bragging, right? The Arabs, you know, it's, it, you know this, this was one of those things when I was studying at Azhar, I felt like I was able to identify with more than many of my classmates because I'm, I'm, I'm black, American. I'm African American. And we actually have, I always tell people, in Black American culture, bragging is not considered rude or impolite. People brag all the time. It's not a, it's like when you see like Muhammad Ali, and he's talking about how pretty he is, how good he is, how fast he is. That's the cultural pastime. But 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 you know how pretty he is, how fast he is, how you know people boast that you know it, it's almost I like to say when you are situated inside of a culture in which people are um, uh, dedicated to making you doubt yourself, they want you to see yourself as less than, want you to see yourself as ugly, incapable unintelligent, bragging becomes resistance, right? Bragging becomes a form of resistance. Bragging almost becomes an assertion of my, my, self, my self worth and my value, right? The pagan Arabs, they also, can I answer your question go home, but answer your question. The pagan Arabs also used to brag. That was a big thing in their poetry. Like the poet of the tribe, his job was only to brag about the virtues of the tribe. And what's crazy about it is the bragging they would do is just like the rappers that brag right now. They talk about the money they had, the power they had. You know, I'm reading one line of poetry where this poet was talking about the preeminence of his tribe. And he said, man, and you know, in pre-Islamic, you know, Arabian ethics, nursing, right, uh, established, a connection, establish a familial connection. So he said, man, when any one of our women give birth, there's a line of people trying to nurse the baby from here to Yemen, just so they can be associated with us. You know, that was like a, like a pre-Islamic ghost, just so they can be associated with us. This is who we are. They say, if any one of our tribesmen is wronged, we will come together and push on the person that wronged them so strongly that when we show up to the battlefield, the earth sinks in. Because it can't even hold the weight that we, we like we're that numerous. When we stand on the earth, the ground sinks in. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 
you know, a lot of their boast was about Asabiyah, like how, how much love they had for their tribesmen. He says, man, when so much as a single hair on the head of a member of my tribe is touched, my dog started barking. My bow started acting all funny. You know, it's kind of like these, these are the kind of tribal ethics that they really, and this is, man, this is, this is who they were. So when the Prophet وسلم, would say something about who he was, he would always append his statement with wala fakha, meaning, I know how you guys like to boast and that's funny. Like you guys like do this. This is a cultural pastime. Talking about how big you are, how good you are. I'm not doing that. I'm telling you the truth. See, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not playing that game. This is this is real. See, what you guys are doing in your poetry, what you do amongst each other with the bragging and the boasting and the cockiness and the ego, that's all just for sport. When I tell you I'm the best of God's creation, I'm telling you the truth. This is this is truth. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, what's that? The prophet said that, not me. <laughs> Yeah, he is the best of God. Right? This is, I'm telling you this because it's true. So he said, the best of names is my name, Muhammad. Like, this is the best name. He said, and names that have Hamdel in them. So Mahmoud, Hamid, uh, uh, Hamad, uh, all of these names, right? Um, he said, and names that have Ayn Badel in them, Abdullah. That's, that's a name that Allah loves, Abdullah, right? The name that he mentions here, my name is Muhammad, my name is Ahmed. Now, hold on, son, hold on, son. Um, you know, in the Quran, Christ, alayhi salam, he gives glad tidings of a messenger who will come after him whose name is Ahmed, Jesus Christ, alayhi salam, gives Bani Israel glad tidings of a messenger who will come after him. And he says, what's Muhu Ahmed? His name is Ahmed. He doesn't say Muhammad, he says Ahmed. Now, mashallah, mashallah. Just, just the, the power to stop the class. I have that power. Okay, you carry on, carry on, carry on, right? His name will be Ahmed. Then the Prophet said, I am Al Mahi. Al Mahi literally means the eraser, right? A mimha is an eraser in Arabic. I am the one by whom Allah obliterates disbelief. That the Prophet is the one by whom kufr is erased, right? He said, I am Al Hashir. I am the gatherer at whose feet all of humanity shall gather. This is one of the distinctions of the prophecy of Muhammad. That every prophet before him, and this is you know, this is one of those things that you read the Quran and you realize that linguistically the Quran is so precise. Now, the word comb in the Arabic language means a group of people that are linked by common parentage, but in a patrilineal, they have the same fathers. When we say, nahnu qawmun, it means our dads are all related in some way, right? Every prophet in the Quran who addresses his people says, ya qawmi, oh my people, except for Jesus. Jesus never says, ya qawmi, because he does not have a biological father. Jesus never says, Ya Komi. He says, Ya Ben Yisrael, O children of Israel. That's like one of those subtle things in the Quran. You know, this book is from Allah. Right? Right? Because it's not, it's not like a generic that the prophets, all of them just say, Ya Komi. No. Prophets that are from the Kom, they say, Ya Komi. Jesus never says, Ya Komi. He only says, Ya Ben Yisrael, O children of Israel. Because I'm really not from your Kom. I don't have my I don't have a biological father. My mother is from your people. But comb is a, is a patrilineal connection. Now, the Prophet وسلم, was not sent to a single group of people. He was sent to all of humanity. His letters 
to the Najashi. To not you, not you, not, not you, Najashi. Ashram <laughs> ibn Abjad, the man after whom you were named. Right? His letters to the Najashi, his letters to Kisra, his letters to Heraclius confirm that what? His letters to the Coptic Christians confirm that what? He was a prophet to all of humanity, not just to Arabs. Right? He's reaching out to them. Inni Rasulullahi ilayhum jami'an. I am the messenger of God unto all of humanity. This should inform the way we see our neighbors. This, like, this was a paradigm shift for me. When you think about the Ummah of Muhammad, وسلم, the Ummah of Muhammad, know that his Ummah consists of everybody from the time he was sent as prophet until Yom Qiyamah. That means all of these people, all of your neighbors, all of your colleagues, all of your classmates, all of your co-workers are from the Ummah of Muhammad because he is the prophet who was sent to them. He is their prophet. Even if they don't know it, he is their prophet. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes every ummah on Yom Al-Qiyam line up behind its prophet, and they will be judged according to whether or not they answered the call of their prophet, all of us will stand behind the prophet Muhammad The only separation we make is between ummah to da'wah wa ummah to istijada. You have ummah to da'wah the community of Muhammad that has been called to the path, and Ummatul Istijaba, those that have answered the call. Those that have answered the call. What this means for all practical intents and purposes is that all of our neighbors, all of our colleagues, all of our co-workers, classmates, people we pass by in the street, we are from them and they are from us. They just don't know it yet. Right? But we don't see them as like, oh, you know, just, I don't know, this, this this is actually your deen. This is, you know, this wasn't, it's not like you're living in the time of Musa, alayhi salam, or you're living in the time of Jesus, or you're living in the time of Zachariah, or you're, you know, you're living in the time of Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? And, and, and I think our task is finding a way to say that to them effectively, right? That Muhammad, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, is your prophet. The other thing that the name Al Hashim indicates is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a great um, joiner of people. They say one of the signs of a great woman of Allah, a great man of Allah, is that they bring people together. They bring people together. Maybe people that otherwise would not be together. People that, you know, if it were not for uh, our love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and our love for the person teaching us, we probably would have no basis to be even in a room together. You know, I always joke with people that, you know, before I became Muslim, there were only three kinds of people in the world. Black people, white people, and Puerto Ricans. <laughs> That's it. You know, if you weren't black and you weren't white, you must be Puerto Rican. You know, so all of you, man, I would have looked and said, you know, they, they're Puerto Rican. They're, they're Puerto Rican. They, they have to be. They're Puerto Rican. As now, I'm black, Zeki black, I'm black, he's black, my children are black. But the rest of them, Sanya, Puerto Ricans. Obviously, Puerto Rican. I mean, that, that, that was, that was, that was, that was it. Did you see Yeah, no. That's what I'm saying. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm just saying, but those are my three categories. Since having become Muslim, and I have formed meaningful relationships, friendships, bonds of fraternity, sorority with people from all over the world. And I marvel at that. That were it not for Islam, we probably would have very little basis to even have a meaningful conversation. And here we are eating at each other's homes, joining in you know, the worship of God together. You know, playing significant roles in each other's children's lives, etc. And you're from Bangladesh, and I'm from, you know, Chicago. But such is the beauty of Islam, right? Such is the beauty of the Prophet ﷺ, to bring people together and hashim. And he said, "I am al-aqib, the final, 
after whom there is no prophet. The name Al-Aqib, the final, means the one after whom there is no other prophet. Right, so he is Khatimul Anbiya wa Rusul, the seal of the prophets and the messengers. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. An Hubayfa Kala Lakitu Nabiya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam fi Badi Turaqil Madina wa kala ana Muhammad wa ana Ahmed wa ana Nabi al Rahma wa Nabi al Tawba wa ana al Mukaffa wa ana al Hashir wa Nabi al Malahim. On the authority of Hudayfa ibn al-Yaman, who, mashallah, you know, a lot can be said about the, the prophet Hudayfa, I mean, the, the companion Hudayfa. You know, Hudayfa was, um, he was the one to whom the names of all of the hypocrites was entrusted, right? You know, the prophet, والسلام, he said, these are all of the people in the community plotting against the community. And they say that Sayyidina Omar, went to Hudayfa and said, just tell me, is my name on the list? This is Omar ibn al-Khattab, had risked his life on countless occasions for the Prophet um, You know, had, had given everything for the sake of Islam, and he still wanted to know was his name on the list of the hypocrites. Right? We join a group and go around proclaiming, I'm from the same sect. SubhanAllah, where, 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 where do we get this? Sayyidina so, you know, Omar never said, I'm, 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 I'm saved, I'm protected. No, is my name on that list? Right? Hudayfa reported, I met the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam on one of the streets of Medina. And he said, I am Muhammad. I am Ahmed. I am the prophet of mercy and the Nabi of Rahma. Yes, sir. Which bathroom is open? Just the only the bathroom? Let me check. Is there someone that can, that can, is there someone that can take her in the bathroom? Yeah. Uh, the, the prophet Ali said, and the Nabi of Rahma. I am the prophet of mercy. I want you to understand that as comprehensively as possible. This means that everything in the teaching of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam is mercy. He said, "Ana nabi rahma I am the prophet of mercy. That the reason he was sent, "Wa ma arsalnaka illa rahmatan lil alamin." God says, we have not sent you except as a mercy to everything that exists. Right? Rahman. I am the prophet of mercy. He said, and I am the prophet of repentance. That among all of the things the prophet والسلام, taught, the most important thing he taught is that redemption is possible. Despair is from Satan. Despair is from Shaitan. Redemption is possible no matter what you've done, no matter the act you've committed, no matter the mistake you've made. If you desire repentance, Toba is possible. And in the Toba, the Prophet did not teach a path that you walk, you fall off, you can't get back on. He taught a path of repentance. It is a path of mercy. The Prophet ﷺ actually went on record saying, if you were a people who did not make mistakes, God would replace you with the people who did make mistakes and then sought forgiveness for their mistakes. So Allah does not even desire perfection from us. He only desires accountability from us. That I make a mistake, I can acknowledge the mistake that I've made. Right? The Prophet also said, Anal-Muqaffa, I am the one, I am the one followed by messengers sent prior. Al-Muqaffa. The Qaffa means the back of something. Like, 
literally means the back of your head. But the Prophet ﷺ means that on Yom Al Qiyamah, even when the Prophet ﷺ went uh, and prayed at Beit Al Maqdis in Jerusalem, he was followed in prayer by all of the other messengers. So in following the Prophet ﷺ, you are pledging allegiance to all of the previous Anbiya. All of the prophets that came before him, the culmination of what they taught, the culmination of what they were given is in the person of the Prophet ﷺ. So you don't have to worry about whether or not you're honoring the message and ministry of Jesus. You are. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're honoring the message and ministry of Moses. You are. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're honoring the message and ministry of Abraham, you are, in following the way of the Prophet right? He is Al-Muqaffa, the one, Ibrahim. That, that, the, the, the anglicized name is Abraham, but, but uh, the Arabic name is Ibrahim. Right? Then the Prophet said, and Al-Hashim, I am the gatherer, right? He gathers people. And then he says, I am the prophet of the battles. I am the prophet of the battles. Which means, even if you go back and you look at um, the prophets of the Old Testament, some of them were pacifists, like Jesus, alayhi salam. And some of them were warriors, like David, alayhi salam, like Solomon, alayhi salam, like Daniel, alayhi salam. These were all warriors. The Prophet, alayhi salam, spent the first 13 years of his mission in Mecca being a pacifist, being a prophet that eschewed all violence, right? Assassination attempts. Many of the companions were assassinated. They were held under siege. Uh, they were humiliated, they were attacked, and the Prophet ﷺ would not give anyone license to retaliate. So the first 13 years of his mission, he was a pacifist that eschewed all violence. And the last 10 years of his mission, he was a warrior that defended the integrity of the community on the battlefield. The wisdom in that is that Muslims should always prefer peace. Always. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, if you are at odds with anyone and they incline towards peace, you should incline towards peace. Right? The preference is always peace. Allah says in the Quran, Right? Fighting has been prescribed for you, and it's something you do not like. But maybe you do not like something. Maybe you do not like something that is good for you. One of my favorite tafsirs of this uh, ayah is that all people that have sound, intact souls don't like violence. It's not something they enjoy, right? It's not something that they, um, they, delight in. It's something that when the situation dictates that this is what we must do, they bring themselves to it with courage and reluctance if this is what we must do. So the Prophet ﷺ said in an authentic hadith, never be desirous of meeting your enemy on the battlefield. But if you do, be firm, be steadfast. Right? Be firm, be steadfast. If you meet your enemy, be firm. Let them find no weakness in you. No relent, no retreat. Once that line is crossed. But we should be praying that we don't have to cross that line. I would pray that we don't have to cross that line. But once that line is crossed, no relent, no retreat. You know, let them find no weakness in you. Right? So the Prophet, he demonstrated both, you know, um, both responses to conflict, 
Sometimes the only good response to conflict is a pacifist response, let it go. There's nothing you can do. And sometimes you have to have a, a more active, more proactive response to conflict. You know, what's amazing about this is that of course Christianity, of course Christianity is, uh, you know, it's a, it's a pacifist religion. But Aquinas, and then after Aquinas, uh, Augustine, St. Augustine, they had to develop the just war theory because there's no way that you can have a society that never defends itself. So even though their scriptures, someone hit you on the cheek, turn the other cheek, that's not any real way. Hey, Kita, Kita, you cannot move in the chair, dog. Najash, please, have a seat. Sir. No, over here, sir. Over here, sir. Over here, sir. Right. So my point is, even Christians that have an overtly pacifistic religion, they recognize that the key is balance. You have to know when to be, you know, pacifist. You have to know when to be proactive. Right. The Prophet Ali is he demonstrated that. Right. Mashallah. عن حذيفة عن النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم نحوه بمعنى هكذا قال حماد بن سلم عن عاصم عن زر عن حذيفة. So we have a repeat of that hadith. Now we come to chapter 52. باب ما جاء في عيش النبي صلى الله عليه وسلم. What has been narrated concerning the lifestyle of the Prophet عليه وسلم عن سماك بن الحرب. قال سمعت أن نعمان بن بشير يقول ألستم في طعام وشراب ما شئتم لقد رأيت نبيكم صلى الله عليه وسلم ما يجد من الضقل ما يملأ بطناء. On the authority of Samak ibn Harb who reported, I heard نعمان ibn بشير say. Do you not indulge in food and drink as much as you like? Verily, I saw your prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, at times, unable to find even the lowest quality of dates with which to fill his stomach. Right. So, the prophet, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, lived through great hardship, um, personal hardship. Um, his path was one of taqashuf or deprivation. You know, once a companion came to the Prophet ﷺ to complain about his hunger, and he lifted his shirt, and he had a, a rock attached to his stomach, which somehow they believed dulled the hunger pains. The Prophet ﷺ looked at his rock and laughed and said, lifted his shirt, and had two rocks <laughs> attached to his stomach, right? Everything that happens to you, everything that troubles you is hard on the Prophet. But this is how they lived, right? They had a difficult path. You know, I, I think one of the, um, the challenges of civilization is, and this is also a challenge of child rearing, like I am who I am because of the adversity I had to overcome. Now, my goal, of course, is to give my children a life that they have no such adversity. But how then do you build into them the character that was developed through your adversity? And this is why, um, um, this is why families that have you know, experienced great upward mobility, they have certain rituals that they go camping. They go hunting because they're trying to preserve the instincts that brought them that success. Because their children don't have that, their children don't have that, that instinct. Or they do community work because they want their children to still feel connected to people that are less fortunate. We wake up, we go, and we son, where are you going, son? So you know your pants are on backwards? Yeah. 
You know, they want their children to preserve some of that ethic. You know, I was, I was, uh, I was listening to something somebody sent me. And, uh, comedian, you know, Kevin Hart. And of course, he says, you know, he has a lot more millions than you know uh, he had growing up. And he said, you know, I experienced real hardship. You know, my father was a drug addict. My mother worked all the time. We were poor. He said, for my children, the biggest adversity in their lives is like, Dad, the Wi-Fi is not working. You know, that's, you know, so it's like, how do you give them that character? How do you, you know, what, what rituals do you engage in? So here we see after the Prophet the Sahaba experienced great wealth. I mean, they say money by the time of Omar Ibn Abdul Aziz, you know, who is sometimes referred to as the fifth rightly guided caliph of Islam, they started creating, huh? Let's see. Go ahead. They started creating trust. Like, if you really want to know where Muslims used to be compared to where we are now, you know, even though I, I know that we have some positions on dogs and stuff like that, but when I'm on the north side of Chicago and I drive past a dog restaurant, they have a restaurant. You order your food. Your food is served on the top table. You order something from your dog, he eats from the lower table. Now, part of me is thinking, this is ridiculous. But another part of me is thinking, this is what it means for certain segments of society to be flush with resources, flush with money, that we can't even think of what to do with our money besides create restaurants for dogs. I mean, like, like, like I, was, I was sitting with someone in Birmingham, England, and he was saying, look, you have to admit that does, whether we like it or not, we think it's silly or not, that does speak to a certain level of civilizational maturity. Like this is, their dogs have restaurants, okay? This is where they are. Similarly, Muslims, when Omar ibn Abdul Aziz was thinking of places he could give sadaqah, there was no people that he could give sadaqah to. So he started creating all of these trusts for animals. Right? You have Muslims who gave wealth for water to be placed around the society so dogs could drink. You have people that created bird sanctuaries in Turkey, bird sanctuaries in Egypt. This speaks to a level of civilizational maturity. This is where we are. Like, we can now start thinking about the flora and fauna of the dunya. We're, we're like, our civilizational building has eclipsed just like human poverty. We're past that. We're past. Now we're thinking about how we can take care of the animals. How can we make life more comfortable for the dogs of our society? That, that's something admirable. That's a certain level. When you get to that point, you know, man, I was looking at these birds and I was thinking, they really deserve a warm place in the winter. You, you, you're somewhere now. You're like, there's a, there's your mind, to be there, you're somewhere. You know, the Prophet ﷺ was always there. Right? He saw the man slaughtering the animal. The man was sharpening his knife. And he said, Hel You want to slaughter the animal twice? The guy looked up, what are you talking about? You're sharpening the knife in front of the animal you're about to slaughter. Him. Think about the fear that's inducing. Right? This is the Prophet Ali. So he could get, he was concerned about an animal that was about to be slaughtered. Right? So when you know you read about Muslims now mistreating human beings, right? They say that our society is the most perfectly imbalanced, our community globally is the most perfectly imbalanced community in the world. We have one half of our people dying from overeating, heart disease and you know, morbid obesity. And then we have another half of our community dying of starvation. This is the Muslim community. 
If you want to know who we are, one half of our people dying of starvation, the other half dying of overeating. This is, this, is, this is the disparity that exists in our community, right? Unhealthy extremes at both ends. Some people have an embarrassment of riches and some people are just, uh, you, know, uh, you know, living in extreme poverty, right? So here, Nu'aman ibn Bashir says, look at you guys, all of this money, eating whatever you want, drinking whatever you want. I swear, I saw your prophet, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and he couldn't even find the lowest quality dates to eat. So in other words, he was saying to them, don't think that all of this uh, wealth is a sign that God loves you. Because we know God loved the Prophet and he experienced great hardship. Son, well, I actually sit in. You just, you just, you just, you know, get what you want anyway, anywhere you can. Son, son, there's a class going on. Right? An Aisha ta, kala, kunna al Muhammad, nam kutu shahran, ma nastau kido binarin, in huwa illa tamru wal ma aswadan, aswadain. On the authority of Aisha, radiallahu anha, she said, we, the family of Muhammad, would remain for an entire month without kindling a fire, meaning no cooked food. There were only dates and water. Sometimes this is what they would eat for an entire month. Now, I want you to think about leaders in our time. It would be hard for us to imagine somebody being a leader and their family living in such, uh, with such meager accommodation. We couldn't imagine that. It would be unimaginable. We're like, you're the leader. You have everything at your disposal. You can just say this for me, give me some money. Who wouldn't give it to the Prophet? The Prophet was showing integrity. Aisha was speaking. Kina. Can't do that, man. The Prophet Aisha was speaking to what his integrity, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And by the way, for those of you wondering, many people say that the diet of the Prophet might have been like semi-vegetarian, right? That he might have, oh, I think I'm entering some family arguments here. You know, I saw I saw the wife go. Right. And I, saw, and I saw the husband say, there's my steak tonight. There goes my steak. But, <laughs> that, that maybe, maybe he ate meat a couple times a month, if that, a couple times. You know, we eat meat a couple times a day. Right? A couple times a month, if, the, if that. Maybe a couple times every five weeks. Right? Here, Aisha is saying, there would be months in which we would only have dates and water. That's all we had, dates and water. You know, a good friend of mine, uh, Dawood Yassin, he said that he wanted to try this for Ramadan. So he did the first 10 days of Ramadan. Najash, what are you doing, son? He said he did the first 10 days of Ramadan, suhoor. I think he said nine dates two mason jars of water. Iftar, nine dates, two mason jars of water. That's it. And I said, after the 10 days, how did you feel? He said, hungry. <laughs> he, said, no, he, said, but he said that it was uh, the level of focus. He said, man, it was, he said it was really, son, 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 son. He said the level of Kind of attuneness that he experienced, that there was a there was a spiritual openness, there was a you know a sensitivity and a certain awareness of what was taking place in his environment, like he had never experienced before. He said after the tenth day, his wife was like, "Okay, that's enough. You cannot do this anymore." Right? He said it was. 
He was like, man, you should try it. I said, no, I don't think so. <laughs> he said, so who? Nine dates, two mason jars of water. If tar, nine dates, two mason jars of water. Did that for 10 days. Talk about a cleanse. That's serious. That's serious, right? You know, one of my um, teachers, he would say, you have to understand. Why? Why? Why, son? Why? It was, uh, you know, he said that, you know, we don't understand the difference between the substance of the sunnah and the symbols of the sunnah. He said, the symbols of the sunnah, we're into those. The substance of the sunnah is different than that. He said, if you want the substance of the sunnah, he said, you know, when you go to, to the masjid for iftar in Ramadan, and they give you the little date and the little pakora, and you know, the little date and the little thing and the sliced up bananas and the watermelon. That's just like your appetizer. He said, for the Prophet, I that's the, that is the Utah. And that's just, you know, we're just eating this. For us, it's like a little palate cleanser. You know, a little watermelon, some sliced bananas, you know, a little uh, zambusa, right? A couple of dates because we're just, for us, we're just getting ready for this makloob or this, you know, go shabriani or we're just getting ready for the, you know, some, some beef spare ribs and, you know, a plate of rice big enough to feed a family of five just for me. This is, we're just getting ready. No, he said, when you eat that, make that the iftar, then you'll understand the sunnah. But have your little bananas, your little watermelons, a few dates, a little zambusa, a little water. Go back to fasting. That's the sunnah. It's a lot different than the symbols of the sunnah, right? The substance of the sunnah, right? An Abi Talha Kala Shakona Ila Rasulillah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Al Jua Warafa'ana and Botunina and Hajar Hajar. We just talked about this. On the authority of Abu Talha, who reported, we complained of hunger to the Messenger of Allah, and uncovered our stomachs to show him some stones that we had tied to them. He uncovered his stomach, showing us two stones tied to his. Right? So, I don't know. You know what? I'm gonna stop there for just a second because I just realized I haven't prayed off. Before going down, inshallah. And I'll, I'll come right back, inshallah. I just want to say, this is the Mutaras. Allah 
No, we'll end there open for questions because the next hadith is like very, very long, as you can see. And I won't be able to won't be able to cover the whole thing. Very long. It's a very, very long hadith. 
أبو بكر فقال رجاء في دنيا أبا قال خرجت ألقى رسول الله عليه الصلاة والتسليم والتسليم عليه ولا جنب جاء عبر يسأل الله حديث so we're open for questions, comments, concerns. Do I, the, the questions, you do realize you're only wearing one sock. Okay, mashallah, mashallah. Okay, I you know, hey, you know, you know, you know, honestly, and this, this is, you know, you think about the guidance of the Prophet of Islam being so comprehensive. They actually mentioned in a hadith that the Prophet didn't like when they wore one shoe. They didn't say anything about socks. <laughs> but they said that, you know, that sometimes if they can only, you know, we can't imagine this stuff. They can only find one shoe. Just sometimes we walk around Medina and find one shoe. <laughs> and the Prophet will tell them two shoes or no shoe. I don't know. You know, there's some things like I probably could put together a book of those things that the Prophet, he just disliked them. He didn't say like it was evil or you know, Shaitan wears one shoe. He didn't say anything like that. He just says that he would see them wearing one shoe and he just didn't like it. Say, wear no shoes or wear two, but wear two shoes. Don't just wear one shoe. You know, you know something else that the Bible says I really dislike that a lot of us do? When a person knocked on the door and you said, Who is it? They say, It's me. <laughs> he didn't like that. He just did not like that. He would, he would say, What do you mean? Who are you? You know, like, you're like who is it? Me. That was just like, he did not, I don't, that's one of the things, like, he just did not like that. No, say your name. What do you mean it's me? If I knew it was you, I wouldn't ask who it was. So he's like, who, who is it? Obey the law. Ah, you see. He didn't like me to say me. Right? He had those, those things like that. It just those things. Questions, ideas? I know you have questions. I asked you a question on the way home. <laughs> Could be about could be about what we've covered today. Could be about anything else, anything you've been thinking about. Yes. I just have a timing question for the list of the um, of the hypocrites. Um, when did this take place in the uh, like timeline of the seal? Uh, like the very end of the life of the Prophet Alayhi Salam. This, but it was before the Prophet of Sure. Um, I think that the, the 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 upshot of that story is one of tolerance, because I think the Prophet Ali wanted Hudayfa to know, you know, all of these people that you have misgivings about who they are what their intentions are, I know who they are. I know them. And I still treat them with a basic kind of modicum of respect and allowing them to just kind of exist. You know, the Prophet of Salaam was very, um, he was very clear about the fact that he was establishing a precedent, right? And uh, like in, on one occasion, he refrained from doing something is he said, I don't ever want it to be said that Muhammad used to kill his companions. Because he understood, if people think that the precedent is for me to kill my companions, what will they then do to the Muslims? You know, after I'm, you know, long gone. Similarly, I think the Prophet of Islam didn't want to create, um, Majesh, don't write the white the side, sir. When I, when I, think, I think similarly, the Prophet of Islam did not want to create this environment where everyone could be suspected of being a hypocrite. And, you know, it's like that kind of, um, that's a very toxic kind of religious environment where everyone's sincerity is being questioned. So I think the story of him giving the list of the names of Hudayfa is like, look, I know who these people are. You don't, don't, don't worry about them, right? Just be Muslim administer the affairs of the community, make sure people are safe, but don't let this like wrap your mind. Like, you know, if you see somebody, are they a hypocrite? You know, it's almost like when an organization has been infiltrated, you think anybody could be the mole. Is it you? Is it you? Who, you know, you understand? Who's wearing the wire? Is it you? Is it you? This could poison the entire community. So if you have someone that directly from God can say no, 
the people that are insincere, this is who they are. Then it's like that restores your confidence in everything else. Jazz, yeah. no, son. Let me see, son. I want you there, man. I want you there. Yeah, Promise, Jen. This was definitely a set. He was still asking the question, right? Which means that even a guarantee from the Prophet would not insulate him from being concerned about the salvation of the soul, right? Just teaching your class here, guys. Other questions, ideas? Marshallah. Anything online? Marshallah. Love this, love this season, man. Love this weather, man. I hope we get I hope we get three more weeks of it. I hope we get three more weeks. Even, even sometimes you can get, I mean, I, I've been to Chicago where We've gone all the way to Thanksgiving and it was mild. Certainly, certainly to Halloween and it was mild. Uh, and then I've been in Chicago where it was snowing in September. <laughs> no, you know, I've, I've seen it all. I've seen it all. You just don't know. But I do feel like summers are getting longer. Summers are getting longer. I, I don't know, man. It's like you, you live in Chicago your whole life. But like summers are getting longer, right? Okay. Yeah, right. It's a full swing now. Yeah, yeah full swing. Uh-huh. It, it, it can happen, you know. But you know, we, we full swing now. You know, I'm talking about. These are like my these are like my best months because I don't have to cut on the heat. I don't have to, I don't have to cut on the AC. Right. This, this, these are these are like this is like the money saving month. It's yeah. kind of like no air conditioning, no heat. Yes, yeah, it's, it's the natural temperature is cool, comfortable. Because by, by the time you hit November, that once that heat cuts on, money do. And these gas prices now, it's crazy, crazy. So I mean, like our our heating bill. Routinely be four hundred, four hundred fifty dollars a month. Easy, easy. You know, what I mean, you got when you gotta, you gotta, you gotta heat all that. You know, you got uh, a larger space. You gotta heat all that space, man. It's, it gets expensive. So, like now, I'm like, yeah, low electricity bill, low gas bill. You know, I might let my wife get cheese on that burger. You know, what I mean? <laughs> you know let me go ahead and put some cheese on that. You know, you're not running the AC. You get some cheese on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Alhamdulillah. Okay, we'll end there, inshallah. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Subhanallah, Rabbil Izzati, Amma Yasifun, wa salamun ala al-Muslim, wa alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. MashaAllah. Getting there, we're getting there.